and welcome to this week's GG Weekend Watch and I am back and I'm so happy to be back but again a huge huge thank you to Rob for standing in whilst I was away covering the racing league of course but Rob is back though but in a different guise we have Rob as the super sub again then this week is what is going to be his new term I think from now on covering for Daryl Carter as the tipster this time around as Daryl as you may have seen on social media is currently walking around a water park or something like that on holiday at present Rob of course back then alongside the usual the regular Andrew Mount though here consistency to the fore for Andrew Mount was the whole rest of us are topsy-turvy but I'm so happy to be back for this weekend's action because we have so much to look forward to it's two-year-olds to the four of course at Newmarket and the Curra. we also have the small matter of the Cambridgeshire as well as well as a few races at Haydock to get stuck into too so before we go on though uh the lads I'm guessing you've had a decent time of things from a tipping front recently okay no we've lost all our viewers um we haven't tipped a winner since you went uh, off to get get the big bucks from tv's racing league so, uh, yeah, we need you we need you well that, that was the exact response i was hoping for to be honest with you but i find that very hard to believe from what i've seen on social media you've all been doing very well so that is very tricky to believe but we're going to crack on with the action though and we're going to begin at the cura with the group two beresford stakes for two-year-olds over a mile at 135, where it's no surprise to anyone, we have an Aidan O'Brien horse heading the betting with Adelaide River. So Rob, seeing as you've been doing such a stellar job for us, would you like to kick us off, please? I would, I would. And um, yeah, great to have you back, Kate, as one of the um, YouTube comments when I was on was, uh, Kate Tracy's let herself go a bit, was <laughs> one of the main comments that we had. <laughs> on the, on the, so um, yeah, so I'm, this time I'm filling in for Daryl Carter. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be really unoriginal, and I, I can't actually look beyond the favourite here, mm. simply because of the Aidan O'Brien link. He's won 21 of the last 26 of this, which is ridiculous, including the last 11. Um, eight of the last 10 winners have been the favourite. Um, he's he's got a bit more experience than um, than his stable mate continuous. So unless he's a superstar, then it's Adelaide Rivers here. For, for the taking he's bred for the job it's by australia but very very simple but not a strong bet but wants to kick you off with um adelaide river yeah no i like that angle a lot then i like the stats then behind the aiden o'brien record in this race and he has the top two in the betting but like you say adelaide river with that extra run to his name so it is adelaide river for rob andrew how do you play this race yeah again uh, echo rob's sentiments about welcome uh back kate we, we, we miss you, you and uh I just, uh, yeah, and hopefully Daryl will be back next week. Won't have to suffer any more vi um, videos of Junior Donald Trump in his, uh, his Florida playground. <laughs> <laughs> All he got across the hat is just a perfect example of what he is. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, again, the the Aidan O'Brien angle is very difficult to get away from in this race. Uh, one, one interesting thing, though, is that in the last 10 years, only seven of the O'Brien runners had had just the one previous start. Five of those won. And uh, three of those started favourite on their debut, and they all won. And um, that certainly brings into uh, in continuous because we know that you know uh, genius though Aidan O'Brien is, a lot of his horses improve with racing experience. Some some of the uh, the gr uh, the greatest horses from the yards have been beaten on their race course debuts over the years. And um, yes, yeah, so continuous the fact that he went off favourite for that debut win um was quite significant i think and at the prices i'll just side with him over the favorite adelaide rose oh so it's an eight no <laughs> yeah so andrew taking on uh rob then with continuous at 11 to 4 rather than the six to four about adelaide river but uh both of the lads said looking towards the bally door horses at the head of the market for our opener at the curra we move on to new market to next where we have more top class two-year-old action with royal lodge stakes which is another group two over a mile and we have a very short price favorite at the head of the market we're flying on us as the 47 market leader so andrew only four runners here how do you play it yeah you look at pure ratings you look at speed figures you think well flying on us is um run faster um if you just like take take any set of ratings like top speed in the racing post is run faster in all three of his starts compared to anything else um you know the rest of his um rivals have clocked so you think i mean i did look at the oh you know five to four on is probably not a bad price i think that's seven to four on now but the angle generally with the rolling mile at new market is to side with early pace and you know, which would explain why mark johnson now charlie and mark johnson have got such a good record at this track and uh, you know if, if you look at this race 
you know, we have had um, the occasional upset and it's often been caused by, you know, Mark Johnson. He, he's, you know, he's had the winner a couple of times. So the fact that um, when the price is open, Dubai Mile um, winner from the front the last twice uh, has been sort of nibbled at from 14 to 1 into 11 to 1. You think maybe that's the angle, probably for the forecaster without the favourites. I, I think Flying Honours will probably win. Um, but, you know, um, uh, on day one of this three day meeting, we saw Mark Johnson take the opener with uh, a horse who'd finished eighth on its debut, who was in the van throughout. So I just think the value might be without the favourite Dubai Mile or the forecast flying on us to beat Dubai Mile into second. But I think the favourite will win. Oh, I like it, though. But more betting angles and ways into this race than just sort of having to side with the 47 favourite, despite there only being four runners in this race, which Mr Mount has given us. Robert, how what do you play this race? Yeah, not not too much to add to that, really, other than I thought it was interesting that Greenland came over here rather than in the last race that we previewed and, and then been edited. But yeah, you, you you can't really get away from flying colours. He's clear clear on rate clear on ratings. Um, Corobus won this last year for the for the same yard. Um, it's a no bet for me here. I mean, flying colours could be absolutely anything. He's won nine and a half lengths and five and five and a half lengths on his last two outings. Um, but yeah, not not really a bet for me. But I, I same as Andrew, I do think flying colours um, goes in here. Yeah, exactly. It's very difficult to get away from, as you say, on all of the figures that we have at our disposal. He just comes out on top of everything, but price is reflective of that. So at least there are some other ways to play it, but it is difficult to see past him for the win. So we go back to Haydock now, where we have a far more open betting heat as we switch uh, tack here and we go to the old Boston handicap. A 0-105 handicap for three-year-olds and over, over a mile at 205. Lads, if it's okay with you, I'm going to kick us off here because I like Auditor, who is available at 8-1, to one, clearly comes here in very good order, continues to progress through the handicap rankings, just missed out on bringing up a hat-trick last time out, when second behind the other joint favourite at Newbury when... Uh, he took his chance back in a class two handicap. He's been given a, a further one pound rise for that one length defeat, but his hold up style should suit this race. He has an ideal draw here in still late where middle tie draws have been seen to a positive effect in this race in recent years. And he can give some sort of recompense to Sean Levy after his torrid week as well, because he takes the ride on what remains a very progressive horse. So it's auditor for me here, Rob, who do you like? Yeah, I was looking for a progressive three to four year old in this. Um, Montsab sort of sticks out, but I thought it was a shade disappointing actually last time at Ascot. But I thought Danny Tudhoe gave him a shade too much to do there and I'd probably be ridden a little bit more prominently this time. But um, I actually landed on uh, Aku Nigelar. I don't know if that's how you say it. Is that I'm right? so happy you said it first. <laughs> yes, not, I've, got, I've got a big four question marks. Uh, <laughs> He was no match for Mike Prospero and reach for the moon last time. Um, I think I was probably a shade, a shade too high a grade for him. But this looks much more to his liking. Um, he absolutely hacked up in his maiden, and and, and rewatching that back, he thought you know this this could be a really really good horse. Um, Roger Varian can do absolutely nothing wrong at the moment either. So um, yeah, in the same colours as Sakir last weekend, um, I, I I sided with him at, at around five to one. That that was my play. I thought thought it might be a, a nice improver here. Yeah, so more Saturday success and potentially in the KHK Racing Limited colours after that record-breaking Saturday last weekend. Was it seven winners on the day, I think, for Roger mm -hmm. Berry across group races, across uh, handicaps then as well? It really was outstanding. That man, David Egan, of course, on board as well. Yeah, I won't repeat the name because I'll absolutely butcher it. But what Rob said, basically. Uh, Andrew, anything <laughs> you can't pronounce in this race that you want to side with? Yeah, well, I, th I think you're both barking up the right tree with three-year-olds in this race. Uh, we've, had, we've had nine, nine runnings in the last 10 years six three-year-old runners three four-year-olds but that doesn't really tell the whole story because uh, um, twice when four-year-olds won it there was only one three-year-old in opposition uh, and they were priced at 10 to 1 and 11 to 1 respectively so they weren't necessarily uh, you know anywhere near the head of the betting uh, and sometimes when you've had the three-year-old winners there's only been you know, one or two in there and they've often finished first and second so they get four pounds from the, uh, the horses age four and above I think you've really got to side with with, with uh, uh, the younger progressive horses, as Rob was saying. I think they've got the wrong favourite here. I'll be amazed if Montesib is favourite. I mean, uh, he's 9-2 to two market leader at the time of Ryan. He's a four-year-old who won his first three starts and since then has been chinned at odds of 7-2 to two favourite, 4-1 to one joint favourite and evens favourite. Couldn't even get the first three last time out with even money. 
Uh, I think he's a, he's a terrible price. He, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll take him to be out the first three here. Um, <laughs> of the older yeah. horses, I was quite interested in Astro King because this is a Sir Michael Stout, Sir Michael Stout trained runner with a first time visor. That's pretty rare. Um, since the start of 2019, 27 first time visor runners from the yard, nine winners, 33%, profit at £35.50. Uh, the expected winners was only four and a half, so he sort of you know double um, what you'd expect based on their market prices. He is a five year old carrying top weight, but if you do want to uh, side with an older horse, don't be put off by that one. So, again, I've sort of like you gone through all the three year olds, um, can make cases for both yours quite happily. Uh, I was interested in the race in which Harrow and Billy B ran in at uh, Doncaster last time yeah. out. Seven full and Kazoo handicap, good race. Now, it was an advantage to be up at the pace that day. The winner, New Kingdom, Charlie Appleby's, was uh, you know, made all. Uh, the runner up, Dirty Old Town, close up, beating the head. Uh, those who were coming, trying to come from off the pace, really inconvenienced. Now, Harrow did best of the closes in third. There was a 12 to 1 shot that day. Billy B did second best of the closes in fourth. Uh, was 15 to 2. Now they both beat Roger Varian Zain El Arab, who was the 7 to 4 favourite, another one who was inconvenienced by the pace bias. So you look at their prices now, Harrow is 10 to 1, Billy B is 12s or 14s. Um, you know, they, they were separated, they were only, uh, there wasn't much between them last time out at, uh, at Doncaster. I can see them finishing 1 2 here, and at the current prices, you're going to get you know, 120 to 1 or something like that for the straight forecast, maybe even bigger. So I, I'd back Harrow and Billy B each way. Oh, I like it. So that form line to be following in then Billy B and Harrow, both at fair prices, 10 to 1 and 14 to 1 as well. Yeah. And for the pair of them, Billy B with that course and distance win to his name as well. So like those angles a lot. And yeah, and what is a very open race? That's probably may well pay to be the way to go right we're back to new market now it's group one chiefly park stakes up next so another contest for the two-year-olds but it's a big one for the phillies over six furlongs at 225 where meditate leads the way at the head of the market so andrew group one action take it away please yeah the interesting thing about this race is you'll hear a lot talked about the um uh, the contenders you'll hear very little about the draw now you go back to last year when we had a much bigger field um, the draw played a massive role in this race. Um, the first four were drawn 11, 13, 2 and 12. The one who really caught the eye against the bias doing best of those to race down the middle was Sandrine, who, of course, we've seen do really well in her recent starts when, uh, you know, cut back to seven furlongs. So this meeting is a bit odd because it's, we've got the stalls in the centre. But generally speaking, at Newmarket, you want to be prominent against either rail, um, particularly in the Cambridgeshire we've seen in the last several years. High draws have, mass uh, have been massively failed. Now, uh, this meeting last year in the first race, I think they went far side. By the time of this race, they were all coming down the near side. So although we've only got 10 runners, I think the draw can play a role. I wanted to be against those drawn very low, uh, including uh, Meditates, um, yeah, the favourite, if not, uh, is he favourite at the moment? Five to two, I think. Joy yeah, now George's favourite, yeah. Yeah, so, so I was looking at those drawn higher. And uh, I mean, I've been so impressed by Trillium. Uh, I think she's an absolute superstar. And mm. she was ch chinned on her debut, you know, albeit, you know, um, you know, the forerunner Goodwood Maiden, but obviously needed the experience. Since then, she's just taken off, hasn't she? Yeah. Uh, bolt, bolting up by four lengths at uh, Newbury, dropped back to five at Glorious Goodwood, seven to one, absolutely hacked up over the consistent Rocket Rodney, followed that with a, um, a game win over the Platinum Queen in one, one of the juvenile races of the season, I thought. That was a fantastic finish. Mm -hmm. That pair finished four and a half lengths clear of Crispy Cat, who, of course, was in very good form early season, including at Royal Ascot. Uh, I think going back up to six, um, you know, that draw seven to ten, if they do come towards the near side, which I think they will by this point, uh, I think she's got a fantastic chance. And I'd have a clear favourite ahead of Meditate here. Uh, I think because perhaps she's trained by Richard Hannon and not, uh, you know, a Goldston or Charlie Appleby or an Aidan O'Brien, she's perhaps gone a little bit under the radar. And I'd have a sort of seven to four here rather than five to two. So there's a spot of value there, um, despite the fact that, you know, um, the, you know this race, you know, the. Uh, the, the Everyone kind of knows these horses and knows what they're capable of. The, the one at a massive price that might run half a race is uh, Mal Rescue for George uh, Bowie, who um, was beaten out of sight last time out at Doncaster behind Trillium. Um, but 
something went wrong that day she lost her action it was soft ground and if you if you uh, and bear in mind that um, she was only nine to one to beat Trillium that day mm. and now she's 50 to one um so she was a single figure price got beaten 24 lengths obviously something was amiss uh, other than that she's never finished out of the first three and um you know although she hasn't encountered ground on the fast side of good which it might well be come saturday 50 to 1 you can sort of take the chance so i'll go trillium over uh, mel rescue yeah like say 40 to 1 then mel rescue if she is okay then after that third i mean just a 13 day turnaround after losing your action you're gonna mm. have to hope that well george mm. Bowie obviously knows his philly yeah. better than anyone but yeah, you're going to have to hope that she is okay. And that was just sort of a blip on the day that, that she just didn't cope, like say maybe with the softer ground more so than anything. But she's been readily dismissed, hasn't she really, in this betting? But other than that, Trillium's take on Meditate at the head of the market. Trillium, just such a wonderful, wonderful, likeable type. So Rob, who do you fancy in this race? Cannot disagree with that. Um, <laughs> I would say Trillium is probably my favourite flat horse. Yeah. Oh, nice. Think. Yeah, absolutely love her. Um, mm -hmm. I was actually at Goodwood for her debut where Andrew mentioned she did get beat. She was absolutely green as grass that day. Um, it was probably the worst race card I've ever been to, actually. I was more there for Carl Cox afterwards, but I did get to see <laughs> in the parade room. Um, and Is he was... a stand-up comic? I've not heard of him. <laughs> DJ, Andrew, DJ. Um, close, close. <laughs> but... Um, she was noticeably bigger than uh, some of these horses that had had a run and been on the go for a little bit but she yeah. she um, she was noticeably bigger she's really filling out that frame now um she she uh, that performance last uh two weeks ago was really impressive gave uh, platinum queen far too much rope over mm. five furlongs and, and somehow managed to pull it back i couldn't believe it um so that was really really impressive she's just getting better and better like andrew said i won't won't go over old ground but yeah, she rates a really good bet for me in this. I thought Meditate looked quite a bit of a tricky, tricky customer maybe last time, got to the front and never really looked like winning even when she hit the front um, and obviously bumped into a good one and then came second. But I'm not sure the rolling mile will be, will be suitable for her. But yeah, Trillium would be a really good bet. And the, the other bet that I'm going to have in this race as well, um, I couldn't get a price earlier, but um, what's she called? You're it? too shrewd, Rob. Better your accounts club. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, don't don't get my account banned. Um, <laughs> they know, they know you. <laughs> Juliet Sierra. Um, it looks a really, really good improver for Rafe Beckett, and I'd like to have a bet on her to finish in the top three. Um, she's got not really got any turn of foot, but she just gradually goes through the gears. She did it really well last time. She only won by a head, but it was kind of one of those where she was just sort of just doing enough. She galloped on strongly. She's got a good attitude. She's really improving for Rafe Beckett. And I could see her staying on um, past a few of these in, in, the, in the closing stages and picking up some of the pieces. So, um, yeah, two bets, but 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 Trillium, the main one, really, really strong bet for me. Yeah, so the lad going in with a two-prong attack then for both of them from a betting perspective. It Well, if Rob can eventually get on once he's finally hoodwinked the bookies to actually get his bet on Juliet Sierra there at a fair price. But both in agreement about Trillium. And of course, last time out, it was fascinating at Doncaster in the Flying Childers to see uh, the, the Platinum Queen and Trillium facing off then after they were both breaking the course record at Goodwood on their previous starts as well with Trillium obviously coming out narrowly on top there. So I think that that is really likeable form line to be following and totally agree with the pair of you about Trillium, to be honest with you. I think she looks a fair price there. Right, we head back to Haydock now for a 0-105 to handicap for three-year-olds and over, over five furlongs at 240. Wide open race, as we'd expect. Plenty of characters we know loads about from this season and beyond. So Rob, nice easy one for you to solve, please. Yeah, really, really easy this. You're uh, welcome. <laughs> I, this is... This is a bit of a cliff horse for me, really. It's oh, great might stuff. be the last time now. Um, but Nomadic Empire, I do think, is, yep. is, is well handicapped here. Um, has won off 99 and placed off marks at over 100. Off 93 here, slipping down to an attractive mark. I think this is probably the plan from David O'Meara. Um, so on the back of last time, much much improved performance, actually, in the Portland, fourth of 19. So showed a bit, bit better form. And I think that might have been down to getting a... Bit, bit of cut in the ground potentially uh, having been running on uh, sort of good to, good to firm um i think he looks really well treated here and um prime for a big run and and hopefully uh yeah hopefully he's well handicapped and he do the business that cliff that cliff you're just yeah. edging ever nearer yeah. ever nearer with what, the 
we're getting towards the end of a season, so you may as well just keep following him off, off of the end of that cliff. There's so nomadic empire yet again for Rob as Andrew is cheering on. Go like, on. Can read your blog. Go on. Yes. <laughs> Care to elaborate? <laughs> um, no, uh, zero blue. Oh, nice. Oh, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, five to one into two to one, and then um, missed the break. Um, mm -hmm. Paul Mulroney fanning about trying to get her organised on a track that's massively favouring front runners, and then uh, just got in, up on in the shadows of the post from uh, "Loves Me Like a Rock," the one that you Taylor tipped. <laughs> oh, nicely done then. Get getting one over cue as well, and against the bias then. Nicely done, Mister Man. That's your job yeah. done for today then. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, I'm off. That's it. Um, yeah, uh, back to Haydock, please. If if, yeah, if you if you're back in, in yeah, I do, I, I do like this race. Um, some some old favourites in here. Um, I mean, Count Dorsey won this race two years ago. He hasn't won since, but he does go well this time of year. He was third in the Portland last time, um, but ideally he'd need it softer. And uh, it's been interesting because uh, Kirkland and Telwright generally gets a lot of stick for overwatering Haydock. Yeah. Because at, at the last meeting, rain was forecast. He didn't water, it didn't arrive, and it was very quick. And we had a whole host of non-runners because the ground was too quick. Um, so it might just be a bit too fast for Count Dorsey, but um, if he doesn't run it, you know, well, here maybe when we do get some proper soft ground, perhaps in October time, uh, one to keep an eye on. Uh, Isle of Lismore, another one to keep an eye on. He's he's reliant on um, small fields, so five wins in fields of six, seven, seven, eight, and nine runners. Um, Alligator Alley um, uh, would be interesting. It, it, it generally attracts money where, where, whenever he runs. The race yeah. wasn't run to suit over course and distance last time, he's finished fourth. He's done best of those to come from off the pace. The winner, second, third, always up there. Um, now the fifth stablemate, Nomadic Empire, um, the, the one that um, my illustrious colleague mentioned, um, he was also held up. So he did second best of the closers. And then, of course, went on to place in the Portland behind uh, Chipstead, who I still maintain needs to go left-handed despite him keep winning on straight tracks. Um, but so, so, yeah, Alligator and Nomadic Empire both of interest. But the one I'm going to side with is um, the sound reason for the first-time blinkered Kevin Ryan angle. Um, ooh, Kevin Ryan horses and first-time blinkers, first-time cheap pieces as well, tend to do really well. Now, I, I had a big bet on Fast and Loose last week for the Bronze Cup, 40 to 1. He's finished second by Shorthead to Danzan in the first-time blinkers. Um, now he um, is at, had, had actually won in first time cheap pieces earlier in his career, as had um, Sam Reason. So I think, like with Fast and Loose, the, the effect of the cheap pieces is worn off over the sort of course of several starts. So uh, with the first time blinkers to hopefully liven him up, uh, coming out of store five, maybe Sam Reason. I think it's a big price as well. Can give us a run for our money here. Yeah, the outsider of the field, 25 to 1 then for the former really? course distance winner in the first time. I yeah. <laughs> just go right down then in the vetting to find sound reason. So, yeah, we, we, we don't dismiss that whatsoever with a good reasoning. Well, if we have sound reasoning, oh, God, I hate myself really? that, for that. Really hard you, even, even I'm just absolutely disgusted with myself for that. So I'll swiftly <laughs> move on. <laughs> But it was no, nonetheless never be anyway. Of a good pun. Come on. Oh God, no, not when or, it's that. Or a crap one like that one. Yeah, exactly. I'm in good company, to be fair, aren't I? Right, yeah, Newmarket. Yeah. We're back here again. Turn of the Colts now. Uh, the group on Middle Park states for two euro Colts over six furlongs at three o'clock. Where interestingly, Marshman heads a betting from Blackbeard in second. So it's a question of how do you weigh up the top two two-year-old form lines, really, and who should come out on top there for? So, Andrew, fascinating contest to establish this two-year-old hierarchy. Who do you like? Yeah, uh, and again, um, even though we've only got, um, what is it, sort of eight runners here, the draw could still play, play a part. Mm. Stalls in the centre. If by this point they've decided they all want to come down the near side, then, you know, um, Zoology and Stall 1, Blackbeard and Stall 2 might not be in the best position. Um, it's not the, the strongest race, is it? And although Marshman's drifted since the betting opened seven to four out to eleven to four from stall six, I was quite happy to side with Carl Burke's runner. He's likely to be up for the pace. I mean, that I know it was only first, but my god, to win by eight and a half lengths that was some doing, wasn't it? And yeah. uh, although he got chin next time out, that was at York behind Noble Style. And uh, I, you know, I thought it wasn't a betting race for me. Um, so, you know, I'm always a bit like Rob, you know, cautious, putting my name to something that I'm not going to be supporting with hard-earned cash myself or, or in, in, in my case, e easily earned cash because I'm just a chancer. Um, but, yeah. Um, and again, 
<laughs> one, one interesting angle about this race is the amount of front runners who win it. Now, you look at the role of honour of this race, um, the number of times the best horse hasn't won, you know, is, is quite interesting. We've had, you know, um, I mean, 25 to 1 winners, 22 to 1 winners. You see horses ping out, make the running against a favoured rail, and then never sort of improve from that or sort of live up to this sort of form again since. So um, in the last 10 years, 12 horses have made the running. You know, a couple of times you've had two disputing the lead. Six of those went on to win for a huge profit. Horses who've, you know, even prominent racers, you know, have struggled. So mm-hmm. being on the front end is massively important. I thought that would count against um, Persian Force, who tends to come from a little further back. Um, and so Marshman, in the hope that he makes the running, I thought could win it. Oh, Marshman then on the front end to justify his place at the head of the market for Mr. Mount there. Uh, Rob, interesting then this race. I mean, of course, we don't have Sakir from last weekend doing the quick turnaround. We kind of doubted that was really going to happen. But this is going to help us establish a lot of the two-year-old hierarchy for all that we don't have some of the big guns that we've seen this season. But who or where does your pin land? Yeah, uh, opposite to Andrew, really. I, 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 did, I didn't think Marshman was it was a what was the favorite for me um got got a lot to prove it's clearly progressive but i thought there's better form on offer and i i like the i like the group one form blackbeard's bringing i think persian force is a good little marker um always runs his race he's ultra consistent um really likable sort but um blackbeard beat him and had him well held by half a length last time in france he's taken a bit bit of time to get going hasn't he since the coventry and he's a little bit he's a bit of a nutter let's be honest yeah um yeah. he flopped in the coventry um I, I think that was might have been more to more to do with the ground maybe than than anything else um and and like i said he was taking a bit of time to get over to sort of get into himself and he's, he's performed really well in france since then he likes to raise more prominently um and i think that'll suit suit this uh suit this race at, at newmarket um and yeah i, I thought it was a, i thought it was a really solid bet at, at around 130 of, of what he opened up so yeah blackbeard for me please totally agree with you rob i am completely in your camp here as well with blackbeard like you say i think i like it. i think i'm drawn to him because he is a screwball <laughs> he's just oh he's just mad isn't he and you like pirates okay and you like pirates. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and we like pirate exactly it's just one of one of my two things i love nut nutters and i love pirates so what better way to combine it than beside him with blackbeard is how i'm going to do all of my tipping from now on um yeah the fact that my cornish accent comes out and i sound like a pirate half the time does also play into that i think as well but uh, yeah as long as he doesn't lie down at, when he actually gets to the stools this time around because he always threatens to lie down doesn't he, he really yeah. sort of plays about but in the race itself he is just sort of a model professional, really, isn't he? He's super likable then. And I agree with you. I just think he's getting better and better. I think he has the stronger form. I love Noble Style. But I think that Blackbeard has more showing of that form time and time again. So I'm in total agreement there about who are a Blackbeard. Right. Back to the Curra then. Uh, we go back here for a hugely competitive sales race. It is the return of the Goths Million for two-year-olds over seven furlongs massive prize money on offer and it's attracted a really good lineup as a result so who am i on to now rob uh, no andrew back to you please if you're back in the room there goffs million who wins it yeah this is an incredible race because um as, as the name implies an awful lot of prize money on offer six hundred and eleven thousand euro to the winner which mm. might explain why quite a lot of senior british jockeys have gone over there you know yeah. um, for one ride on the card um, to get a slice of this, you know, Holly Doyle riding uh, Archie Watson, he's a monster, for example, uh, who was a winner at uh, Chelmsford on his recent debut. So, uh, I mean, I, I've been through this, and this, I wasn't massively keen on, on Helsing's, um, you know, last run at, at Tipperary. I, I know the Edna O'Brien horse, so I think it's fifth in that race, has come out and won since, but there's a few who have been uh, beaten as well and disappointed. Um, Hiawatha, second favourite, trained by Aidan O'Brien, wouldn't put you off that one. But I was looking at some of the English who ran, sorry, the British, I should say, who ran in that Doncaster sales race, um, the, the the other golf sponsored race. Um, Cold Case won that. And again, it, it paid to be drawn a lone race on the far side that day. Uh, Cold Case made one on the far side for Carl Burke, uh, coming out of stall seven, followed home by you know, horses drawn four and one. Now, um, the winner of the second and third were up with the pace throughout. Um, Galeron or Gail Ron, who was fourth for Charles Hills, did best of those to come from off the pace. 
um, drawn in stall eight. And then at six in that race was Richard Hannon's magical sunset. It was only seven to two, but weak in the betting when the um, the draw bias had been established. Drifting from five to two came from the back and um, you know could could only get within sort of six lengths of the winner. But given the pace bias, given the draw bias, I think the magical sunset run was um, worthy of an upgrade. I'm a big fan of Chris Hayes. He, he tends to be quite clued up when it comes to a track bias. Uh, he's on Hannon's runner. So I'll go magical sunset over Gail Ron or Galeron um, to um, boost that your um, Doncaster form. Oh, like it. Well, but a fair price is about the pair of those. So magical sunset 16 to 1, Galeron at 20 to 1 then as well. So both of those two fair prices representing the British runners and flying the flag over at the Curra. Rob, are you feeling quite so patriotic or are you siding with an Irish horse? No, I am. I am. Um, yes. I, I, this would be a bit more of a watching brief, but I'm going to have a couple of quid each way on just probably just because of the name. He's a monster. If he's any <laughs> things like his name, you'll hack up here. Um, <laughs> I, I liked his debut at uh, at Chelmsford. Um, you know, raced prominently, looked look pretty uncomplicated. He's stoutly bred by no name, never. He's also got a bit of Dabali in there on the damn side. Um, Holly Doyle goes over for the one ride. And, I, I, and yeah, I, I, you know, Archie Watson with his two-year-olds, always good to follow. Um, not going to be my biggest bet by any means of, of the weekend. But I thought if he could get a few places here, and I, I thought he's a monster, might, you know, might prove to be quite a decent horse in time. Yeah, like I say, you don't really name a horse. He's a monster if you don't think they're going to be pretty no. special in time, do you? So, yeah, he's a monster. Potentially another very good result for No Name Ever then at the weekend for another two-year-old with he's a monster there. 12 to 1 for Archie Watson in interest and that Holly Doyle is going over as well. Right, we sign off then with our final race that we're scheduled to cover with uh, the easiest race on the card. It's the 340. It's the Cambridge Estates, the ha Heritage Handicap, four three-rods and over, over a mile, one and a half furlongs. Wide open, Rob. I'm sorry, I feel like I'm giving you the short straw time after time with these handicaps, but over to you, please. Well, as I'm taking Daryl Carter's play, so I may as well talk <laughs> a little bit, aren't I? Um, <laughs> I? I've got three for this, obviously. Mm, fair enough. Fair wide open. Um, I'll, I'll spin through them pretty quickly, though. First two are for last year's winning trainer, Saeed Bin Uh Brilliant light. I thought I'd had a very similar campaign to, to the one that won last year for him, um, having gone to Maidan. Um, early on in the season and then running sort of similar races. Ran well at the John Smith's Cup, fifth, uh, fifth place, and ran well in a big handicap at Goodwood as well. Um, I think he put a line through his last race at Yarmouth. There was just no pace on, really. This will be much more his cup of tea. I thought he was a good price at 25s. Um, then at right at the bottom of the handicap was Electrical Storm. Oh, sorry. Yeah. The other thing about Brilliant Light, before I go, is uh, is install 23. So um, each of the last six winners have come from 21 or higher. So that's another um, added, added bow for him. But Electrical Storm also gets in here off an absolute featherweight. Um, he shaped really nicely last time in a class two over a mile. He was staying on really well, having been outpaced. So I think the one mile, one furlong here is going to suit him. He has, he has run well over the uh, over 10 furlongs. So I thought that was interesting. I think he, he'll, he'll be staying on late in the day. Kieran Fallon's also an eye-catching booking for, for, for that horse as well. And then from the bottom of the handicap, um, right to the top, uh, the 2020 winner, Majestic Dawn, uh, has got some really good form on the rolling mile. Um, has placed here several times. Won, won once, uh, had a second, a third, and a fifth. Um, so I thought he was interesting off a career-high mark. I thought he might be a bit too high in the weights, but he does have a claimer on, um, taking off seven pounds. Um, and... and you know, he's had a good campaign as well. So he's won a listed race at York um, and been placed in a group three. So I, I thought he I thought he got a fair shout as well. Um, so, yeah, three for me. Oh, fair, fair enough. Completely. When we have, what, 29 runners to have Absolutely. to aim at in this race, I think three is perfectly fair. And you've made a very good case for them. And there's fair prices all around as well. Uh, Andrew, you're allowed three selections as well, if you would like for the Cambridge. Or yeah, what? I mean, might I'm not, it up. I might have eight. I mean, Sky better eight places. Most firm are six. Um, and then yeah. if, I, if I back the winner, I might be able to get my aircon fixed because it's blowing out heat, but it's meant to be on 19 degrees and cool at the moment. Uh, <laughs> oh, the troubles of living in a sauna, yeah. yeah exactly. Now, um, uh, this is going to sound like horrible after timing, but uh, I, I did <laughs> nap, nap Majestic Dawn when he won this two years ago at 40 to 1, put him up in my gym. Oh, no, I, we have this every year, don't we? we have yeah, I, th I think he got me into um, profit on the racing post naps table. 
if I tipped a 40 to 1 in this race, it wouldn't get me into profit on the Racing Post nap table. It's such a torrid time I've had this season. Um, but again, I, I'm, I'm playing the draw. And um, although Rob's going back to that 2020 renewal, I am as well, but with a different horse, runner up from Lucanda. Um, now, um, Lucanda's coming out of stall 27 and uh, is wearing blinkers for the first time, which is a massively strong statistical positive for the Rafe Beckett yard. And uh, he had a winner in the first time blinkers at Kempton on the all over this week. He's got one running in the finale at Newmarket um, today, um, with Churcher. Um, hopefully that's going to win as well, because I'll back that one at 11 to 2. And uh, um, I mean, the key to Lucanda is ground on uh, good or softer, ideally. Now, it's a bit tricky at Newmarket because I think they call it a good, good to fill in places. But my God, they did not put a lot of water on the other day. There is some rain forecast for Friday if it arrives then um, Lucanda from stall 27 at round about 25, 28 to 1, could run a big race. Ross and Ryan's an interesting booking. Um, Ross and Ryan's a bit like Joe Funny. When he's on a horse for the first time, you think, well, well, you know what the tactics are because he's got a reputation for being a front-running jockey. So yeah. Ross and Ryan is really good from the front. I assume all that's going to happen, as is often the case with first-time Blinken runners. I mean, of course, uh, Majestic Dorm is uh, wearing that headgear for the first time when winning this two years ago. Uh, it's just going to be a case of blast and go off towards that near side rail. And, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll be inclined probably not to back him each way. Maybe just have a small stake saver uh, because he's, he's probably going to burn himself out and finish last or, or, or go on to win it. So, uh, Lucanda for me. Um, there's another very interesting one among the high numbers, R. Coob, um, 50 to 1. Uh, well, I think the last of the 50s went when I pressed the button earlier on, but 33s now. Um, <laughs> com comes from off the pace, which is perhaps not ideal for the rolling mile. But in this race, if, if you're backing one each way, six, seven, eight places, you're often looking for somebody who's not going to be up there disputing the pace then drop away, but something that's just going to be ridden patiently to come through and pick up the pieces. You know, maybe you're going to finish fifth beating 12 lengths, but you're still going to get that each way pay. Mm -hmm. And you look at his, you know, you look at his record, he's very, you know, very rarely out the first three or four. A couple of times he has been this season. Uh, he was 12th at Epsom when he failed to handle the track completely. And then he was 16th of 18 at Goodwood when drawn in the car park. Um, but you look at his wins as well. They tend to come in big fields, um, you know, a couple of them in the fields of 12 and 15 runners. He really impressed me last summer when he won at Leicester. Um, very hard to win from the, uh, from off the pace at Leicester and in smallish fields. He, he's, he's done so against the pace bias and uh, albeit off a mark of 82, he's now rated 93. But I thought our coup for William Jarvis, Connor Plan is taking off seven pounds, 33 to one plus each way. You know, a million places uh, is the one for me. So, so I'm Lucanda Arkub, uh, and the other ones are old mate Jimmy Hendrix, yeah. who um, was given a shocking ride when I napped him in the Britannia, finishing third. He'd caught the eye um, winning against the bias at Haydock the time before. He had to be on the inside that day. He's won round the outside from off the pace. So you thought, well, surely in the Britannia, 30 runners at Royal Ascot on the straight mark, he's just going to be given a patient ride. What happens? Rob Hornby makes the running. Disaster. He wins at Newmarket last time by a short end, probably should have won by four lengths, but again, wasn't given the best ride, even though he won. And then last time he's gone to Goodwood, drawn in the car park in the Golden Mile. And the interesting thing about Jimi Hendrix, every time he's lost, he's always bounced back to win. Mm -hmm. um, three from three. Um, so you know, maybe he's got a touch of the Oxos about him and um, that, that could be another angle with him. Now those three are drawn 27, 28 and 29. There's your TriCast. Don't say you weren't told. Exactly. Go for the high draws then. And you've made a good case behind the draws even for each of those horses as well. I thought Jimi Hendrix was a huge danger on that basis. And I've only just submitted him such as the trappy nature of this race, understandably so. That I had to admit them for some reason. He was one that just about fell by the wayside for me. So I'm terrified that you've just tipped him up there as well at 14 to 1. But I'm taking two in this race. I might reevaluate it and go for four, to be honest with come you. On, but... Come on, Kate. I mean, you're getting a grand a day for working for the Racing League. You can put a four <laughs> in so why not do what I want now and it's, I needed I needed about four horses for all of those racing league contests and I still wouldn't have got the winner anyway um, so, so I need to come back to form in the Cambridgeshire but I've got two at this stage totally charming being the first of which who clearly has just massively improved his form since joining the George Bowie Yard from a Dennis Quinn Yard and of course that since he has gone into handicaps as well he's won three times now for the Yard and I don't think he was disgraced whatsoever when he was turned out again quick enough then at, at Ascot last time out in the Royal Hunt Cup, 
finishing ninth day, runs off of a pound higher mark here. But he is slap bang down in the middle in stool 15, which is just sort of on the cusp where I was like you, Andrew. I was wanting higher draws then for this race, such as the bias. First time tongue tie. I'll have to rely on you, Andrew, for first time mm. tongue tie for the George Bowie performers if you had anything to hand at present or something that you may have to look up in time. I'll give you time for that one. No, uh, he's already I'll, I'll been. I'll tell you it's a really strong stat, lump on. Thanks so much for, for just falsely boosting my confidence yeah. behind but him. I appreciate they're, they're it. Very, very interested about the draw, where the split will be, because I think Majestic yeah. Dawn is drawn right in the middle and sort of still 14 or 15, tends to blast. Um, could decide. Yeah, could mm. go either way. I know, and then Totally Charming is probably going to follow into the far side, <laughs> which I really hope is not going to happen. But yeah, Totally Charming, I thought I had every chance again then. And he's already been nibbled in the market. And one that's more difficult to make a case for, but it does at least have the higher draw, Perotto. Dear old Perotto and still 20. Now, this lad really has to defy a, a notable drought then because he hasn't actually beaten a horse home on his last three starts. And even prior to that, he only beat one home as well in a listed contest at Windsor. He's had a torrid time of things this so far this season. But obviously, he's stepping back into a handicap now. He is still running off of a higher handicap mark than his last winning mark, which was in June of last season. That was a hugely competitive mile handicap at Ascot then um, uh, in the Britannia. And since then, that was his last win as well. So for all that, he is still running off of a four pound higher mark than that. I just think that this is the perfect time that he's got all of his conditions back in his favour with that high draw again. Marcus Dragoning has had a decent time of things for a few runners as well in recent weeks. So I thought that Perotto, with the perfect turnaround time, off of a mark that might still be feasible, provided he still has that uh, gusto back in uh, for his races as well, this four-year-old, surely he must do. And this is a race I'm hoping is going to set up perfectly then for him. So that is for me, uh, those who Perotto and totally charming in the Cambridgeshire. Right, all there is left for me to do, well, apart from getting your naps, is anything from anywhere else. So Andrew, back to you, please, for anything from anywhere else. Um, yeah, disappointing to see Gabriel the Devils being drawn in store 13 at uh, Chester. Tends to... Um run really well in September, October, and I think has um, sort of had four runs at uh, Chester in that sort of time period, three wins in a place, but seven furlongs in store 13, not for me. A uh, chumps of 6.33, dig two. Um, it's got a really good record in small fields, Hugo Palmer's runner. Uh, coming back to sprinting will suit. Um, did too much too soon at first, go the seven last time out. Loads of winners have come out of that, including Dan Zan. Uh, store 10, uh, not ideal, but dig two could go well, and that's 6.33. And uh, Zayn Al Arab, another one I mentioned who was inconvenienced by the pace bias in that um, seven full of kazoo handicap at Doncaster the other week when uh, Harrow was third, um, Billy B was fourth. If that pair um, you know, run well and, and frank the form for the holder porters in that race, then um, Zayn Al Arab and the 520 at Newmarket could go well. But I've not looked at the pace map to see whether there's a, a strong enough early pace for them yet. Perfect. So just stay tuned for that then and read Andrew's blog based on that pace bias then when he uh, has seen it himself or does the work then for it himself. Rob, anything from anywhere else? I'm going to really let down the Daryl Carr fan club here and say I haven't, I haven't got, I, I, not through lack of trying, but honestly. I, I, thought, I thought you were going to say um, Brough Park 237, Trap 6. Uh, just like, <laughs> really go for it. Come on. Uh, you can if you want. <laughs> I mean, it is bloody hard, isn't it? When you get the decks at sort of 11 o'clock or just after to then sort of cover oh, nine yeah. races properly and yeah. then look at other ones as well. So. And yeah. do all your work. You're, you're perhaps to appreciate how uh, underpaid and overworked we are now, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Rob has no, no answer back to that. And I think it's rightly so. I think it's very fair that you leave comments that. Rob, very understandable that you don't have any other bets and especially with the eight races that we've covered in depth today. So I'll come back to you though, Rob, for your nap of the weekend, please. Oh, not to Trillium. Absolute darling. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Stole it from Andrew as well before he got in there. Andrew, was it going to be Trillium? <laughs> uh, no. Um, I mean, if, if you gave me like, you know, a 20 quid free bet and I had to go on the win, I think I would do Trillium at five to two. But if, if I could be each way, I'd go tenner each way on our coup at sort of 33 plus. Uh, I think given is, you know, how the race is going to be run, given the likelihood that he's well drawn and there's pace on his side. I think he'll be staying on well at that near side rail. He, he, you know, you could get on, he could be six and beat him, say, several lengths, but you still get, you know, make a nice profit. So I'll coup each way in the Cambridge in the big race of 340. Like it a lot. You're definitely allowed to have an each way nap then for the Cambridgeshire, and especially on a weekend like this. And I am going to go audit it then. 
uh, might just go each way as Andrew has or follow his lead in the 205 at Haydock because why not at this stage? So a big thank you to the lads for all of their hard work. And as per usual, thank you so much for welcoming me back as well. It's great to be back in this seat and talking all things Saturday racing, previewing it again. So thank you so much for watching. Best of luck for your bets this weekend. And we'll speak to you again next week.